Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday, brought to you by developer2architect.com. My name is Mark Richards. I'm an independent consultant, hands-on software architect, and also the founder of developer to architect Today's lesson, lesson one, will be on event-driven architecture, request-reply messaging. Within event-driven architecture, we know that we can leverage messaging to apply to really any kind of architecture style. This gives us that composability when we look at different architectural patterns and styles. The messaging or request-reply pattern is very, very powerful, but it is an asynchronous protocol. And so usually the question always becomes, how do I get a response in an asynchronous kind of protocol? And that's what I want to talk about because this messaging channel right here really consists of two queues. There's a request queue in which we send the request to a different service or application, and then a reply to in which that service or application sends us the response. Now, these are both still asynchronous. I like to call this pseudo-synchronous messaging because here's what happens. When I send a request to another service, let's say to get the name of, of a customer, watch this, I wait, but now once I sent that, I no longer have to wait. I'm free to do whatever I want to do. Now, as that service is processing to get the name, I'm able to do some other processing, then I wait. I do a blocking wait on that reply queue, and then that service component on the right-hand side, once it's done retrieving the name, sends it to me, and now I have the name. And that's essentially how this request reply pattern works. Let me show you in a little bit more detail how this works technically uh, using something called a correlation ID because we do have the sender and the receiver in the same thing you just saw here. So the sender, notice in this reply queue, by the way, that there are messages already there. These are, let's say that we're getting the first name of a, of a customer. Um, those first names are already there, but those aren't ours. Now, what I wanna do is send a message to say, give me the first name of customer ABC. And so notice when I send that message to that request queue, it has an ID there, number 124. So I send this request to the queue. And then what I do is then I do a blocking wait on that reply queue using something called a message selector. Now this could also be a message filter waiting for the message ID where that correlation ID, that CID equals my message ID, which is number 124. Now notice, as I said before, there's still a couple of messages waiting to be retrieved. Notice those correlation IDs are 120 and 122. They're not mine. So now those are gonna sit on the queue until that person's ready to retrieve those. So now the receiver receives that message from me on ID 124 and goes and does a lookup of the name. They then set that correlation ID equal to my original message ID. In other words, that number 124 there, and then sends the response. Now notice when that send happens, that gets another unique message ID, in this case, 857. But the correlation ID is my original message ID. Now that goes into the reply queue. Now notice I'm doing a blocking wait waiting on that receive for that specific correlation ID. And there it is, number 124, with that message ID from the receiver, 857, and then I get my specific first name for that customer. Now there's another way you can do request reply messaging, and that is with temporary queues. It's uh, a lot simpler, but here the sender and the receiver, there is no response queue initially. So I want to send a message. Instead of using correlation IDs, I'll use something called a temporary queue. In other words, the reply to in the message header itself. So I'm saying reply to temporary queue T1. And so the message broker itself will create this temporary queue. Now here's the thing. No one knows it exists except inside that message. Notice that reply queue there is giving me the name of that queue. It's usually a, a, a UUID, for example. So now I just simply wait. I do a blocking wait on that reply queue because it's only mine. Now the receiver receives that message. They do the lookup for the name. They send the response. And now I don't need a message selector. I simply just get that response. Once I receive the response, the message broker will then remove that queue. And these are two ways in which you can use or uh, apply this request reply pattern with an event-driven architecture. 
If you want to see some code on actually how this works, for JMS 1.1 and 2.0 using ActiveMQ, you can go to my GitHub repo at WMR513 slash messaging and look at the request reply code. Um, alternatively, if you're interested in RabbitMQ, you can also go to my GitHub re repository at WMI513 slash streaming and look at two different classes, a trade generator, which is generating messages, and a trade validator, which is picking up those messages, validating that trade, and sending it back up to the trade generator on a blocking weight. So you can actually see both of those. So this has been Lesson 1, Event-Driven Architecture, Request Reply Messaging. Stay tuned on developertoarchitect.com, where every Monday I'll be posting another short lesson about software architecture. Thank you very much.